Good afternoon and welcome to all of the alumni who are joining us today for our third Thursday's conversation, the last one of 2022, but not the last one of this academic year. My name is Janine Birchie Johnson, and I serve as alumni director as well as director of campus ministries, and I have roles in admissions and development as well. Just a couple of housekeeping details before we get started. Um, if you have a technical concern at any time during the webinar, please send a chat message to the AMBS host. And if you have a question or a comment that you'd like to ask our speaker, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, you'll find that um, just below what you see uh, showing in the screen. You can also use the chat function to uh, connect if you want to do that with other people who are here today. So I invite you now to introduce yourself through the chat. Remember to send it to all attendees and not just um, to the panelists. And say who you are, maybe where you're coming from, and if you want to add what years you were at AMBS, that would be great. Please note that the webinar, including the time for questions, is being recorded. So now turning to our conversation, Rachel Miller Jacobs is Associate Professor of Congregational Formation, and she also serves as Chair of the Church and Ministry Department and Director of Worship. She graduated from AMBS in 2000 with a Master of Divinity degree, served on the pastoral team of Kern Road Mennonite Church in South Bend for several years, and earned a Doctor of Ministry degree from McCormick Theological School in 2013. She's a practical theologian and educator who has particular interest in how families, small groups, classrooms, and congregations help form mature Christians. On the AMBS teaching faculty since 2012, Rachel teaches in the areas of Christian formation, children's spirituality, worship, and pedagogy. Rachel will start by answering several questions I have for her, and after that, we'll have time for your questions and comments. Rachel, so glad you could join us today. I'd like you to start by just telling us what you'd like us to know about you as an introduction. Okay, great. Um, so I spent my preschool years mostly in Germany and my grade school years mostly in France. My parents were mission workers there. Um, and while that was a long time ago, that has really shaped my sense of the world and of who I am in it. We moved to the US in the mid seventies um, and my dad became president of AMBS shortly after that. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, in my adult life for pay, I've been a high school English teacher, a spiritual director, and a pastor. For not pay, I've been a volunteer in classrooms, an at-home parent, and uh, done some freelance editing and a lot of worship planning and leading in a congregation and Sunday school teaching. Um, my aspiration when I retire, I just turned 61 last week, so I'm, I'm thinking about what's coming next. Uh, a couple years ago, I went to a um, workshop here in Goshen that was sponsored by the Elkhart County Community Foundation, and there was a speaker from the Fred Rogers Center, which is, does amazing work, and she was talking about the simple interactions framework, um, thinking about how uh, even small interactions with children can be really significant. And she showed an amazing video of the interactions that a crossing guard had with the children who came by, um, uh, came by her and crossed, you know, she helped them cross. So ever since then, what I want to do when I retire is become a crossing guard. I've met some wonderful crossing guards who wear crazy clothes and funny hats and then have all these not insignificant daily interactions with children that really influence how those children enter the classroom and then go back home again. And that just sounds like a ton of fun to me. So I'm looking forward, you know, five, six years, seven years, maybe to become a crossing guard. 
And I just have to add here, I assume you know about our AMBS graduate, David Moser, who's a crossing guard in Goshen, and he does exactly this. Exactly. No, I, uh, I uh, talk to David when I run past where he is the crossing guard early in the morning. Awesome. What would you like to add about your family? Oh, yes. Okay. So Randy and I are the parents of three adult sons, and we have two lovely daughter-in-laws as well, and we are grandparents of six-month-old Max. So one of my colleagues recently asked me, uh, what surprised you about becoming a grandparent? And how awesome it is, is the surprise I have. Now, every grandparent says, it's amazing to be a grandparent. Well, I mean, all the grandparents I've talked to. And like many other human experiences, you can hear other people say that and think, yeah, 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 which is what I did for a lot of years. And then I became a grandparent and I was like, that is awesome. Um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing Max in a couple of weeks. We're headed to Florida where he lives to spend a couple of weeks with uh, family over Christmas break. One of the questions I always ask our presenters is if you could tell us a story about a time when you experienced God in a powerful way, and you might have more than one story, but what would you like to share with us about that? Yeah. Um, oh, I have many of those stories, but the, the one that seems uh, particularly relevant to this conversation, because it, it uh, set a trajectory for me that I'm still on. Um, after my dad died suddenly, he was president of AMBS. Uh, before then, I, like I'd been doing volunteer work in my congregation, and uh, and I was thinking, wow, it'd be kind of fun to go to seminary, but like my dad is the president there. That would be weird. Um, it would have been less weird back then, actually, because there were many more faculty and students than now, but still it felt kind of weird. And after he died, I like within a week or 10 days of that, you know, obviously I was filled with grief. This was really devastating. I was in my early 30s. I had young children. He died very suddenly. I loved him. This was hard for everybody. But I uh, probably for the only time in my life, I audibly heard God's voice. Mm, this man choked me up. Say to me, Rachel, now you can go to seminary. And I thought, whoa, okay, um, could we have done that without my dad dying? But maybe not, I don't know. Um, so I, I had this clear sense of both grief and gift and space made for me. And yeah, that was, it was a very, it was a significant experience. And my time as a student at AMBS was, was life-changing. Um, so it did sort of set a trajectory for my life after that event. Wow, I've never heard that story before. Thank you for sharing that. I'm yes. okay, I got my Kleenexes, so. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, I've never heard you talk about that audible voice. So, so then maybe this next question is kind of a no-brainer, but like what attracted you to come back to teach at AMBS, uh, you had been gone a few years, and right. and then this position uh, opened up. And what made you want to come back? Yeah, so um, so I loved. I mean, as I was saying, I loved my years as a student at AMBS, and uh, and even before that, I mean, I was one of the AMBS kids who showed up, you know, at faculty retreat or at the Freedom's Wall Day in the fall. So. AMBS had been sort of part of my life since I was 13 or 14. Um, I, wa I was in pastoral ministry, which I really enjoyed. And, and it also like was clearer and clearer to me that the kind of center of my vocation, well, I mean, this had been true previously, um, is, is being a teacher. Like uh, as long as, as far back as I can remember, being a teacher is what I have loved and been fascinated by. Um, so I was, I was working in pastoral ministry and thinking, hmm, it'd be really fun to be a teacher. 
And it would be awesome to teach about the best things, which would be the stuff you teach about in seminary. I mean, I had been a high school English teacher formerly, and I love literature and I like high school students. Um, but those subjects felt penultimate rather than ultimate. Um, and then actually at the time, my husband Randall was the chair of the AMBS board. And so I was somewhat aware uh, of uh, the faculty getting older. And I thought, okay, this is my shot. If I ever wanna teach at a seminary, and of course my favorite seminary would be AMBS, um, there is gonna be some turnover and I would like to be ready. Uh, when that time comes. So I had a conversation with a former dean, Rebecca Slough, and I said, Rebecca, tell me what do I need to do to be ready in the event that there should be an opening so that I could apply for it. And she and I had a helpful conversation, just full disclaimer. She said real clearly, obviously I can't guarantee you anything. And I was like, yeah, 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 no, I know all that. I just want some like professional advice. Um, so I, I went to get my dean in so that I would be ready in the event that there was an opening, which probably would be coming. And, uh, and when Marlene Krupp retired and there was a need to hire somebody else, I applied for uh, the position that was some of what she had done and some of what some other people had done um, and then was hired. And I mean, for me, other than being a crossing graduate, I'm super looking forward to, like, this is my dream job. This is this is what I uh, am made for and really like to do and the place that I want to do it. Well, we're so glad you are part of the teaching faculty now. So tell us about the courses that you've been teaching, maybe a brief description of each one of those. And then after you explain your courses, if you could explain some of your other administrative roles. Sure. So <clears throat> this fall, I taught human development and Christian formation, which is a first year, often first semester course, where people think both about their psychological and physical development, like how did you become a human being? <laughs> and then um, how, has your, how has your faith formation taken place? And part of what we look at is uh, our ages and stages in relation to that. And part of the function of this class is to help students become aware of their own formation to work at, to some extent, unresolved issues. Like part of the deal is uh, to process some of our own unprocessed material so that we then don't process it on other people's time, students, congregational members, et cetera. Um, I, I also taught a spiritual practices class called Prayer and Scripture. It was originally developed, developed by Dan Schrock um, and then uh, came along to me. So this is a fully online class. HDCF is uh, in person. Every other year I teach it online. This coming semester, I'll teach Christian worship, which I teach every spring, alternating online and in person, and uh, teaching and learning for transformation, a pedagogy course. Um, and that will be in person, and I teach that every other year. I was scheduled to teach children's spirituality in the fall hybrid, so in August, starting in August, but um, registration was too low, so it got canceled. That's an every other year course. I'm trying to think if I teach anything else. I think it's mostly those courses. Uh, is it possible that I teach them all in one year? I think that's true. Yeah. That's what I normally teach. And I teach uh, both online, well, three, I don't know what the, there's not both, um, online, in person, and uh, in hybrid format. So in classrooms where there are, well, aha, in bimodal and hybrid. So intensives where you start online and then are there for a whole week and then finish online. And then bimodally where there are some in the room and some on Zoom. And uh, the other, my other responsibilities, I mean, Janine already mentioned that I am chair of the Church and Ministry Department, um, which means I'm also on the curriculum committee and that I'm also on the faculty status and counseling committee, which sounds strange, but what we essentially do is work at promotion um, of faculty. Uh, I've been on several search committees for faculty members and let's see, I'm the director of worship. 
oh, and then, um, so when I started at AMBS, while I was not the youngest faculty member, there was a considerable turnover. Jamie uh, Pitts and I started the same year, and Jamie is a little bit more in my children's generation. Um, not quite, a little older than that. Um, so I was the next to youngest at that point. He was the youngest and I was the youngest. At this point in AMBS's history, I am the oldest faculty member um, on staff. Uh, and so a couple years ago, Bev and I created a position which I am currently occupying as the faculty elder. Um, which we chose that terminology because I was the oldest. So it's a kind of what consultative position. I represent the faculty to the AMBS board. Um, I have time available for faculty members to talk to me. Sometimes the dean asks for my opinions about things, stuff like that is super fun. I really enjoy doing it. Awesome. Well, well, we'll come back to some more details about those roles later. Um, okay. What are your current research interests this at this point? Right. So it depends how you define research. What's the stuff I can't prevent myself from reading? Almost anything in pedagogy and in what makes people tick. So uh, human development and Christian formation-y things. Um, the, the research research and writing project I'm working on right now is a book I've been thinking around with forever, and I'm trying to get it finished this year, um, dealing with what I'm calling ordinary harm. And what I mean by that is the daily small, but they don't feel small, um, hurts that humans do to each other in families and work settings and congregational settings um, as a human being, as well as as a pastor and spiritual director and teacher, I have bumped into this stuff in my own life and in conversation with other people. Now, I was talking to um, a pastor friend of mine, Tim Peebles in Chicago, uh, just this week about ordinary harm. And he's like, you got to find another term for that, because like if you're living in a war zone, all kinds of terrible things are happen to you, happening to you every day. And he's right, but we only had that conversation on Tuesday, so I don't have a new name for it yet. So if any of you have a thought, put it in the chat. I would welcome it. What I'm trying to do is to distinguish this, to count, to both count this kind of harm as legitimate, like it actually gets in our way uh, personally and interpersonally, and to distinguish it from what I call extraordinary harm, because a lot of the work that's been done on um, forgiveness particularly is like how to forgive your rapist or the person who murdered your child. And I mean, I suppose that's useful, but like neither of those things have happened to me. What I wanna do is figure out how I can remediate the harm that happens between me and my husband or me and my children or me and my colleagues or me and my students or people in my congregation. Um, and much of that is like, it's not, I mean, thank God, literally, not of the murder and rape variety. It's the mean words or disrespect or uh, unkind actions and attitudes. But these still like really get in our way. So yeah, that's that's what I'm researching. And what I've discovered is that to my surprise, the more I think about this, the more complicated and like hard to get a hold of it is. So it's kind of endlessly fascinating. That's awesome. And it it seems like this hasn't been written about much. Is that true? That I'm aware of, really nobody has written about this. I mean, there's there's been work done on microaggressions which has some kind of systems things, and, and I'm folding some of that into my work. Um, and there's stuff in conflict studies, but like this isn't always a conflict exactly. So I, when I was on sabbatical about five years ago, I did a pretty extensive um, lit review and was not able to find really anything, um, which is, yeah, part of why I was like, Maybe this is an area that could use some attention. Great. 
And would you share with us a dream that you have for AMBS? Yeah, one of the things that's really exciting about AMBS is that we are becoming increasingly interculturally diverse. Not necessarily competent, we're working on that, but like there's just lots more diversity. And oh, partly because of my role as director of worship and because I teach a worship class, it seems to me that this diversity offers us the opportunity to mm, grow in our intercultural competence in terms of worship. And that seems to me a unique opportunity at AMBS. Like it's, I mean, there's World Conference and there are some intercultural uh, congregations, but not as many as there might be. We, we tend to group culturally, and I understand why that is. So AMBS seems to me poised to do the kind of sustained work in terms of intercultural worship that is unique. And so one of the dreams that I have is that we could move more deeply into that area logistically and in terms of bandwidth. I mean, there are all kinds of complications, but that's that's one of, I mean, it, yeah. I'd love to see that. My other dream for AMBS is that every AMBS student would have the financial and technological resources they need. Um, I've worked with a couple students who were doing all their classes on a phone and they were online students and wow, that is really difficult. Uh, because it's small, it's super hard to read something. I mean, you could plug in a keyboard possibly. And actually our head of IT, Brent Graber and I were talking about, like the advantage of phones is you can use um, the phone signal rather than uh, electrical stuff. If you can, so that, that works in some parts of the world where electricity, uh, some of our students don't have access to consistent electricity 24 hours a day. But yeah, I would love for all of the students who come to AMBS to have the technological support that they need to do the classes that they want to do. And then um, I always ask people what questions they have for our alumni. And this is kind of a signal that we're getting ready to hear questions from the alumni who've joined us today. So be formulating those and putting them in the Q&A. If you would like to ask a question or make a comment about something you've heard Rachel say, but while they're thinking about that, um, you also have a question for them and you can answer this in the chat if you want. I actually have two questions. The first is, so one of the things I read a number of years, probably when, you know, back in the olden days when I was a lit teacher for uh, high school students, was that one of, one of the significant ways in which we grow our emotional intelligence and broaden our horizons is, is by reading novels that allow us to get into the experience of somebody who's different than us, maybe in a different time and place also. So one of my questions for you is what is a what is a really great novel that you've read recently? Um, and I will just tell you that the one I would recommend to you is a 2022 novel by Dalma Llanos Figueroa, who is a Puerto Rican writer, um, called A Woman of Endurance. And it is a novel about the Puerto Rican slave trade. Um, if you have a lot of especially sexual trauma in your life, this is not the novel for you, but it is a very, it's well-written, riveting, and ultimately an uplifting story of human resilience in the face of very significant trauma. But I, like, I couldn't put it down. Um, so that's my first question. What's a great novel that you've read recently? Would love to have some recommendations. Um, and then, particularly since I'm teaching Christian worship next semester, I'm interested in hearing from you about worship resources or blogs or worship practices that you're excited about and that you think AMBS students should know about. Uh, one of the things I want to do this year is gather a set of resources in the Welcome Black and Moodle for this class. 
not that we will use all of them, but like things I want people to know about. So I'd, I'd welcome your suggestions. Thanks, and I've put those questions in the chat and hopefully people will start adding their answers there. Um, we do have one question that has come in yeah. and that is from Naun. Thank you, Naun, for hey, sending hi, that. Naun. Uh, he asks, what is motivating you to write and particularly on the subject of hurt? Uh, great question. Uh, what has motivated me to write on this particular subject was, first of all, being a human being who's lived 61 years, so I've had some hurts and I've hurt other people, and more specifically, some uh, very painful interpersonal hurts that happened in the context of Christian communities, where I should have known better, but where I thought this would never happen and like we're good people and uh, and it did and it was very painful and I didn't have the resources I needed to work with it constructively. Now I don't I'm not making the claim that all hurts can be remedied interpersonally, even some smaller ones. I mean it takes two or four or however many people are involved. So it takes a certain amount of capacity and willingness, which we don't always have. Um, but I mean, I think actually like lots of authors, I'm writing something I wish had been available and nobody else wrote it. So <laughs> it would have been super helpful to me a number of years ago and it uh, doesn't exist. So I'm, I'm trying to like, I'm, I don't know who said this. I'm working out my salvation, if you want to say it like that. All right, while we're waiting for questions from the alumni, I have a few for you. So we'll start in on those and just keep putting your comments and questions into the Q&A and the chat. Um, the first one is, I, I did a brief description of the Fall Chapel experiment in the yeah. last alumni newsletter, but would you say a bit about what led the worship colloquium? You haven't talked about the worship colloquium much. That's true, I forgot. Yeah. Would you say what led them to try this experiment, how it worked, what people got out of it? What, yeah, yeah those kinds sure. of things. So yeah, I totally forgot to mention worship colloquium. So I lead the worship colloquium, which meets weekly and it functions as the AMBS um, worship committee, actually. We have chapels twice a week on Tuesday and Friday, and this is the group that plans and evaluates um, our worship. And uh, some people take worship colloquium for credit. This last semester, two people took it for credit, and like four people joined for fun because they love doing this. Um, so worship colloquium is the group that I think with about how, how about the worshiping life of AMBS. Um, and one of the pieces of feedback we got last year at the end of the year, so this was probably, a, a, my guess is this was related to a number of different things. We are just coming out of um, pandemic, not lockdown exactly, but the, so we're in 22-23, in the 21-22 school year, we met in person only outdoors. Um, is that right, Janine? Do I have that right? Uh, no, it was 2021. We we met in person outdoors on Tuesday. On Tuesday, oh, that's right. And Friday, Friday on, on Zoom. Zoom. Okay, so we're working our way back into um, indoor worship. But like for many congregations, uh, coming out of that pandemic lockdown uh, on campus, we were really wrestling with with a lot of real experience of isolation. And this was, I think, um, felt most strongly by our campus students who were either international students, so far from family and uh, context and culture, which is hard under the best of circumstances and under a lockdown was excruciating. <laughs> and some of our younger students, so students, often students who come to campus are younger students like, uh, I have a lot of students who live in the area and drive in for classes. So they're embedded in their own context. But for campus students, um, this 
intense need for uh, connection. Um, another factor is actually uh, over the number of years here, our, our on-campus population is dropping and our distance student number, distance student numbers are rising. So we're a smaller community than we needed, than we've been in the past. So anyway, all of this, and who knows what all else, contributed to the feedback we got from a number of our students saying, we really want some small group experiences. Excuse me. And so what we cooked up was an experiment to meet like as the whole group for chapel on Tuesday and then on Friday to offer a variety of small group chapelish so worship small group experiences and uh the, we tried to think of four kind of different things and things that people were already had expressed an interest in so we had a somatic spiritual practices group that worked with Alan Reedy Froze who does a lot with voice and embodiment, and Leah Thomas, who uh, teaches a course in somatic spiritual practices, and then one of our students, uh, Anna Ressler, who is a wonderful biblical storyteller. And then um, Malika Hirschberger and I, so one of our students and I, partnered on a, on a leading, planning and leading an intercessory prayer group, and Andy Brubaker Kaitler and uh, Sue Short, who is a distance student, um, partnered in leading an Anabaptist prayer book, and Janine and um, Jackie Wise Rhodes, who's a new member of our faculty, uh, partnered in leading uh, music, a, a group of people that sang international music, and then often contributed that music into our Everybody Chapel. What did people get out of it? Wow, it seemed to me like there was a lot of buzz, like people were interested in what they were doing. I think there was that kind of sense of intimate connection. Um, the Anabaptist prayer book group met online. So distance students joined that one. Uh, Malika and I in the um, intercessory prayer group it wasn't very big, six people maybe, but super regular. And uh, two students, me as a faculty member, uh, administrative faculty member, and then two employees. And we prayed the heck away for ourselves and each other and the AMBS community and the world. And like, we kept finding like half an hour is not long enough. Like we, you know, we'd pray for 40 or 45 minutes and then somebody would look at the clock and be like, Ooh, we gotta go eat lunch. Um, and the, the music that Janine brought to our whole group was just spectacular. It was a great way to learn music. So I think we, uh, yeah, it worked well. There was consistent engagement and different options. And then also a kind of intimacy that's a little hard to find in a larger group. Now, this is relative, right? Some of you probably go to congregations that have 100 or 200 or more people. Um, Chapel attendance for us hovers somewhere between 25, maybe 30 in the room, uh, and then some joining us on Zoom. So it's a smaller group, but but there is a need for even smaller than that, five or six or seven folks. And a follow-up question to that is, yeah. what are some of your goals for chapels? Oh, wow. Okay, so many options. Well, uh, for me, again, because I teach a Christian worship class, one of the goals of chapel for me is to provide a lab setting for students to try things that might be a little out there or a little unpolished or an experiment that uh, mm, you might not feel as free to try out in a congregational setting. So, so this is a way to, for people who haven't had a lot of opportunity or experience in worship leadership to develop some ease and practice. And for folks who have more, uh, who have had more experience or opportunities to like stretch into something that, you know, maybe you'd be like, I don't know if I do this with an inter inter excuse me, intergenerational group or in my own congregation, but I wanna try this thing. So lab is part of it. Uh, one of the, like sort of no duh functions of chapel is to provide a venue for ongoing Christian formation of us as a 
Christian educational community. So it's not a substitute for congregational life at all. It's, it's not, it's not hour, hour and a half long worship. Um, we, we're changing all the time because students are coming and going. Um, but this does provide a certain kind of spiritual corporate center of gravity for our uh, campus life together, or I should say our educational life together, because we do have distance students joining us um, online. So actually, even before the pandemic, at, at the request of some distance students, we started live streaming um, chapel to AMBS folks. And, uh, and that's been another experiment was to was to practice planning and leading. And again, this started before pandemic and wow, it was so useful once we were in pandemic lockdown. Experimenting with um, participating in this bimodal ways and sometimes even having people lead worship from the screen for people who are from the screen for people who are in the room. So we've been playing with those logistics for a while. Um, other goals, I mean, this is related to one of my dreams for AMBS, it is to, again, do some kind of showing and telling of our worship cultures with each other to expanding our range of uh, individually and corporately for how we can worship. And it's easier to do that if you can come alongside somebody whose primary worship language is different than yours. So, um, yeah, to sing or pray with people who don't sing and pray like you is great learning experience. Also fun, but great learning experience. Thanks. And I'm just going to follow up with that same um, idea. What hopes do you have for worship in congregations? Because you're teaching worship here, mm -hmm. and you also have then an influence on what happens as these leaders go out into their congregations now and in the future. Yeah, so super quickly, I can say two things. In some ways, and, and the preview to that is, I'm, I'm kind of agnostic in some ways about what congregations do in their worship culture, because it really depends on the context in which they're in and the folks who are in the congregation itself. So for many things, I'm like, this kind of song, that kind of song, up, up to you. Um, the two things I have pretty strong feelings about, one is that um, congregational worships should emerge from deep study and immersion in the biblical text, and it should draw us back, back into the biblical text in significant ways. Um, so one of the things I teach in my worship class is a Bible reading process that Professor Amira Tamari Schertz and I worked on together when we were teaching together um, that she named making four hours count. So how to spend four actual hours preparing in a substantive enough way to teach, preach, or plan and lead worship out of that kind of engagement. So we thought four hours was something that people could fit into their weeks. And especially over time, four hours this week and four hours next week and for weeks and weeks and years, you build a pretty big toolbox of significant um, engagement with biblical texts. So that's one really eyeball focused and actually biblical text focused rather than using the biblical text as a springboard. Um, and this is some a passion I share with my colleague, um, Alan Rudy Froze, who also prefers that sermons would not be springboarded out of a biblical text, but really emerge out of them. The second thing I'm very interested in in congregational worship is more of a process thing, which is how are we um, calling out and training many people to be uh, leaders and active participants in, in worship planning and leading. So, you know, this is kind of a lame example, but I'll give it. Um, sometimes the, we're in the season of Christmas pageants and, uh, and those can be seen as performances in the negative way. Um, that are cute, that our children do. Like, how can we, how can we become congregations where the children are actually leading us in worship? 
which would look different than if I led us in worship, and it ought to, but where, where we're really growing the skills of congregational members and participants to engage and even lead in worship in a skillful way. Um, so like, are we practicing with people before they read the biblical text so that they can do it more easily? Um, are we paying attention to who could lead the music or help choose it? Yeah, and I've done lots of both in my role as a pastor and also as a congregational member, lots of planning worship with upper grade school, junior high and senior hires. Um, including, you know, planning and co-preaching sermons and all kinds of things. And it's very uh, engaging for the congregation and an amazing opportunity for Christian formation, as well as uh, significant biblical engagement um, for these age groups that really speak into congregational contexts. Okay, we have a question from Todd Friesen. I'm having a little difficulty Hi, Todd. reading it because it's in the chat rather than in the Q&A. Um, so Todd, I, if I don't get it quite right, uh, please rewrite it in the Q&A because I can only see a portion of your question at a time. Um, but he wants to know, um, oh, sorry trying to find it again here. What do you think worship will look like in the future? And there's more to it here. I'm trying to get to this question. Uh, what do you think the church church's worship will look like in 20 years or will need to look like? And then a friend said that and I'm, I'm not getting the end of it, but I think it's something about how we have changed so much in, we've, we've had like 50 years of change just because of the pandemic. Oh, yeah. Todd, am I getting that right? Uh, please put it in Q&A if I missed part of it. I don't know if we've had 50 years of change, but certainly the pandemic has changed lots and lots and lots of things. And actually, I should have looked this up before I started this. There is a group of people doing research on the effects of the pandemic in congregations. Um, I'd have to follow a few little rabbit holes to find that. So I'm, I, I'm subscribed to their stuff. So like every time they come up with something, I get to read it and they have come up with nothing yet. They've just been interviewing people. So what what will the worshiping life of the of the church look like in 20 years? What should it look like? Okay, I'm not... Uh, trying to evade your question, I haven't the foggiest idea. Um, I think we are in another moment of opportunity. Like part of what happens is we don't try new things unless we can't do things the way they used to. We used to be able to do them. So, uh, and I actually learned this from you and your lovely wife, Todd. Um, and I'll probably say this wrong, but I think the Chinese character here is like crisis and opportunity or something like that. Um, so we are we are in a moment where uh, the way things used to be isn't working in the same way. And so there is opportunity for experimentation and trying new things. What the what worship should always do, I think, is uh, draw us into a vision of God's kingdom, what God is doing in the world, and, um, and into the practices that shape us for joining that. And, and worship is maybe best for, no, I'm going to take that back, never mind, I don't know what it's best for, but that is one of the huge functions, uh, is of helping us know and claim our rightful place as participants in the big project of what God is doing. And if you're like me, you need that in a kind of regular way. I also, uh, I think one emerging opportunity maybe is to um, find our, our sense of 
not just imagined, but actual connection with worshipers around the world. Um, so I would love to see us expanding our capacity to try things that are not uh, our primary language, um, maybe in partnership with a congregation someplace else. Uh, when I was a pastor, I worked at um, some intercultural Bible study where different groups in my congregation partnered with groups in different parts of the world to study a text and speak back and forth to each other about that. Um, I think it, I've never tried this, but I think it'd be super interesting to find a sister congregation either near at hand or farther away and learn their worship practices and try to make them some of our own. But like any of the specifics, I think that's up to leaders and congregations paying close attention to their context, to the times, uh, to the people who are in the congregation. Because again, the, the function of worship is to help us grow up in Christ. It's not the only thing that does that, but it is one of the corporate ways in which we do that. Now, is that going to mean Sunday morning, everybody in the room? Maybe. Maybe Sunday evening, maybe Saturday evening, maybe small groups like we did in our chapel experiment, uh, maybe home groups. I mean, the church throughout the ages and, uh, and around the world has worshipped in so many ways that, yeah, I, I think the forms it takes could be very multitudinous. Wonderful. And now we have a question from Naoon Serato, who asks if you could add anything or remove something from the Voices Together hymnal, what what would that be? And he's he's wondering if you're satisfied with the songs that were selected. Wow. Okay. So awesome question, Naoon. And um, I have not yet sung my way entirely through that hymnal. Um, when the hymnal of worship book came out, I was an at-home parent, and one of the projects I made for myself was to sing five or six songs every day, and I had the time to do that. So uh, I don't have a judgment about what should be uh, omitted or included. Um, in general, what I would say is... Uh, hymnals are useful in gathering some shared resources, and they will always need to be accompanied by lots of other things. So I don't see them kind of as a closed canon, which is why I tend to be uh, somewhat, again, agnostic about one hymnal or the other. I will say in terms of my, well, and, and the other thing is, in my teaching at AMBS, I'm working with people who are not only not all Mennonite or all Anabaptist, but who are not all North American. <laughs> so, so this is a hymnal that's really directed at a specific context. It has some international music, some contemporary music, you know, a variety of things, but, but it is really aimed at U.S. and Canadian congregations, which is another, like, I'm, I'm really thinking about, like, what do students from Tanzania and Ghana and the Congo and Indonesia and Ethiopia, like how can I begin to pay attention to what they need in their context? Uh, so that means that I, I'm like, VT, awesome. Somebody put it together. I love it. Let's use it and then see what else is needed. I will say the Voices Together Worship Leaders Edition is fabulous in terms of gathering very practical, thoughtful, short essays and advice about worship planning and leading. It's still pretty, in my estimation, kind of white and middle class, which is unsurprising. Um, so it's great for what it does. There are lots of things it doesn't do. So again, let's supplement. Thanks. Thanks, both of you, for those questions. To Rachel, if there are others that you'd like to ask, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A. And Rachel, I have been uh, recording the responses to your questions 
particularly about the novels that people are reading, and I'll get those to you later. There's a lot of great lists uh, here, or listed books great, here in the great. chat. I was hoping somebody was paying attention to that, because <laughs> I'm not, and, I, and I'm serious. Like, I will take this as my reading list. Ooh, before we go on to another thing, Jean, can I recommend yeah. some other books to people? Can I tell them sure. what I'm reading? Sure. Okay. So first of all, I want to show you my mug, because I think you might enjoy it. It says, oh my, OMG, you guys, that's not what I said. It's a picture of Jesus. I gave um, uh, Drew Strait a mug like this too. And we're going to co-lead a workshop, I hope, at Pastors and Leaders on Christian formation in light of white Christian nationalism. And a huge part of that is, I don't know what Jesus said. Um, so the three books I wanted to tell you about, the first one is, uh, okay, I'm trying to get this without the reflection. Sexism and Sin Talk by Rachel Sophia Bard. So this is a, a feminist conversation on the human condition. This is a spectacular book. I never thought I'd say that about a book on sin, but this is really a very interesting book. Um, this one is one that I have actually like in-depth read. I'm partway through a book called of Boys and Men, Why the Modern Male is Struggling, Why it Matters, and What to Do About It by Richard Reeves, who's a, I think, Wall Street Journal columnist. I'm not quite sure. Um, and he's making the very interesting and thoughtful and nuanced argument that it's possible for it to be true at the same time that patriarchy is bad for women and that it's also bad for men. And he's talking in depth about how that's the case. Fascinating book. I haven't read the whole thing. And then I just ordered and received a book by Anand Giridharadas. My apologies to whoever is uh, from India out there listening to me mutilating this poor man's name, called The Persuaders at the Front Line of the Fight for Hearts, Minds, and Democracy. I heard him interviewed um, on a podcast. And what I'm especially interested in uh, in this book is um, growing our skills for persuasion in a uh, in a world that is as polarized as ours is. So persuasion, sort of recovering what's good in persuasion, like not manipulation and not forcing people, but like how can we get in the mode of speaking to each other in ways that are persuasive and that pay attention to both what's spoken and unspoken in what the other person is saying, because I, I think both in the culture at large, as I mean, obviously you don't have to be smart to know that, um, uh, and also in the church, like we're experiencing a lot of polarization and we don't have, I think, adequate skills for working well with that. And so this, this question of the unity of the body of Christ is really a significant one. And again, I would say a huge opportunity for the church to do its work and to provide a witness and some skill sets that the culture and world around us really desperately needs. So I just received that one, haven't read it yet. It might be awesome. I'm looking forward to it, but I can't tell you anything more about it other than its title. And uh, we have a question. Uh, can you repeat the title of the second book yes. that you mentioned? Of Boys and Men. Hang on a second. And the subtitle is Why the Modern Male is Struggling, Why It Matters, and What to Do About It. And the author's name is Richard Reeves, R-E-E-V-E-S. Um, it's published by the Brookings Institution Press in 2022. And I actually have the AMBS library copy right this minute. It's not yet been released as an ebook, but those of you who are alumni, is this true? Janine, do alumni have access to the AMBS library ebooks? Yes, uh, and they do? I, I'm not exactly sure how all that works, but we okay. can definitely find out. If by any chance you have access to the AMBS library ebooks, take advantage of this resource. We have a spectacular library and some great librarians. And because we're doing so much teaching of students at a distance, we are really growing our ebook collection. I was born in 1961, so I still like the book and I like to open a thing and hold it in my hands. 
and ebooks are awesome. Yeah. Okay, we have time for one more question. This comes. Oh, this comes from yourself. Mary Ellen Meyer, and she asks: In reading ch current church publications, it seems to me we are concerned about worship that will bring more people into church or into worship. I've been thinking more about being church or God's people in the world. Does it make a difference in our worship if we think of it as preparing to be following God's intention for Jesus followers in the world? Thank you, Mary Ellen, for a wonderful question. Yeah, thank you, Mary Ellen. I, I think you're right on the money, Mary Ellen. Um, you, I mean, I suppose there are skillful ways to use worship to draw people into the church, but I think that model of getting people into the church, I think that's part of what uh, these years are calling us to release our grip on. Um, that said, worship needs to attend to the folks who are present, which as people maybe do come into the church in whatever way they do that requires us to keep expanding and adjusting our worship practices. But, but I guess my own ooh, vision for this is that the function of worship is to help prepare us and strengthen us and recall us to a sense of identity that helps us join what God is doing rather than to get people in to, I don't know, convert them or whatever. I mean, I'm not anti-conversion. It, it, it just seems like that's sort of got the cart before the horse. Thank you, Rachel, for answering all these questions and for giving us an insight into your work at AMBS. We really appreciate that. And thank you to the alumni who've joined us today for your ongoing support of AMBS. As I've said many times, you are our most important influencers, influencers in the church, both of prospective students and donors. And so keep encouraging people you know to consider attending seminary, even just trying one course. If you know of a prospective student you'd like us to contact, please send me their name and contact information uh, to jbjohnson at ambs.edu. I also encourage you to give generous, generously to the seminary, especially here at the end of this calendar year. Alumni are a critical uh, source of support for us uh, and also through your influence on other donors. And finally, I hope you'll stay connected to the seminary through ongoing classes and church leadership center offerings. If you're an AMBS graduate, don't forget the special audit rate for you, and you now have the option of auditing um, online courses. So let, if you'd like to take a class in the spring, let me know. Oh, I'm sorry. That's not, no. I cannot audit an online course at this point. That was only during the pandemic. I'm sorry. Um, next month on January 13th, our third Thursday conversations will feature our global Anabaptist initiatives, and we'll be talking with David Busher, Henock McConan, and Joe Sawatsky about those. Thanks to all of you, and thanks also to student Janet McGeary, who provided technical support for this webinar. This concludes today's third Thursday conversation. I hope you have a wonderful day and a wonderful Christmas season. Blessings to you all.